Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, Director at the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Charles Chavis, Jr., Assistant Professor of Conflict Resolution and History and the Founding Director of the John Mitchell, Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. Professor Chavis' work focuses on the history of racial violence and civil rights activism and Black and Jewish relations in the American South explores how historical understandings of racial violence and civil rights activism can inform current and future approaches to peace building and conflict resolution throughout the world. Chavis co-edited the volume with 60 Vinny Nimu Raba, For the Sake of Peace, Africana Perspectives on Racism, Justice, and Peace in America. His monograph, The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams and the Politics of Racism in the Free State, was published by Johns Hopkins University Press in January of 2022. As the Oregon Humanities Center's 2021-22 CEDEC lecturer, Chavis will appear virtually to screen a short film he produced and co-wrote titled Hidden in Full View, Out of the Archive, Racist Plans Are Laid Bare, on May 17th. The film, which introduces the story of the lynching of Matthew Williams, will be followed by a discussion about his book, this is the final event of the OHC's Imagining Futures series. Thank you, Charles, for coming on the show. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Really appreciate it. Tell us a bit about your background. Sure, sure. So uh, born and raised originally in um, North Carolina, um, right outside of Wilmington in a small um, community known as Browntown um, near Hampstead. Most people when I talk about Hampstead or Browntown, I say Surf City. And so people are familiar with Surf City at that, in that area. So I, I claim that um, um, in terms of my history. And so I come from a very small black community there. Um, went to University of North Carolina Greensboro um, from after high school, um, growing up outside of Charlotte, North Carolina, and just having an interest in history and African-American history. Um, did my um, bachelor's there in African American studies and history. I went on from there to Vanderbilt University, um, where I um, received my uh, master's in theological studies, focusing on black um, uh, and Jewish relations, but also African American and the black, African American relations and the black church in the African diaspora. I um, decided not to go the route of um, pursuing my, uh, pr my PhD in religious studies and theological studies. I wanted to go back um, to my um, true passion to history, and so I pursued my PhD in history. Another shift made my way to Baltimore, Maryland, where I pursued my PhD in history and fell in love with history all over again and the humanities. Um, and I've been working on investigating racial terror lynchings and the history of lynchings um, in America um, and how they can inform our approaches to peace building and conflict resolution since then. Um, but my, all of this work really began in Baltimore, Maryland, um, where I began working at a, a, a local museum, a civil rights museum. Um, and I, I, I can talk a little bit about that later on, but thank you again, Paul. So you're the founding director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race. First, tell us who John Mitchell Jr. was. Sure. John Mitchell Jr. was an anti-lynching advocate. He was a newspaper man. And he was uh, he ran for governor in the state of Virginia. He was a former enslaved um, individual who, um, you know, rose to prominence um, during the um, end of the 20th century and, uh, and a few years into the, um, excuse me, the end of the 19th century and the few years into the 20th century. Um, and he was someone who is overlooked. And when we look at overall scholarship and history associated with the early civil rights movement, um, and so he was a Virginia native. I had learned about him a lot in my work and research on covering racial terror lynchings. One of the reasons I discovered um, Mitchell is because of his vocal and prominent role um, as publisher and editor of the um, Richmond Planet, which was a black newspaper, a prominent newspaper during um, the nadir of race relations in the US. Um, and I was astonished and intrigued by the ways in which he boldly used um, his the, the press to speak out against um, lynching and to speak out against 
those who sought to bring terror to black communities. And I wanted to honor his legacy um, in establishing his, the center, um, excuse me, the program, the John Mitchell Jr. Junior program, which will hopefully be a center very soon. Um, I connected with the descendants of John Mitchell um, and began working to develop um, a program um, that speaks to not only his legacy, but also provides students, educators, practitioners with an opportunity to utilize history um, to work towards transformation and peace um, in the U.S. specifically. So tell us a little bit about uh, the first uh, published book, your co-edited volume, For the Sake of Peace, Africana Perspectives on Racism, Justice, and Peace in America. Tell, what, what's the project of that, of that volume? Sure. And so the project was birthed out of a conference that we had um, post um, George Floyd um, in, in, um, in, in the U.S. And we had the conference specifically in Arlington. We brought conveners, um, we brought, excuse me, theorists, scholars, who, those in the humanities, practitioners, historians from all over the world to the Point of View Retreat Center, which is actually owned by the Carter School. So it's a retreat style um, place um, right on the water near in Lorton, Virginia. And we brought, used this space to bring thought leaders together to think about how we can build an architecture for peace in America. Um, and um, in going to that um, convening and that um, event, I worked and connected with a number of scholars in the field of peace building and conflict resolution, but also scholars, again, in the humanities. Um, and um, I decided as someone new to this field, because as I mentioned, I'm trained as a historian and something that's important, people oftentimes ask me, how do you end up in a conflict resolution school, right? And so um, I'm actually the first historian ever hired at, by the Carter School, and we've been around for, for 40 years. Um, and what I learned in Baltimore um, specifically was um, about the value and importance of history in how we, um, history, but also spaces such as museums and other cultural institutions, the power and the value um, of history and place in helping shape um, how we deal with and confront um, these uh, modern issues that we continue to wrestle with um, within our country around race. And so the book is an attempt to, in many ways, reinvert the paradigm associated with how we approach peace building and conflict resolution by highlighting and analyzing the various perspectives of um, those who are part of the African diaspora, directly connected to the African diaspora, who are not only would see themselves as peace builders, but who are historians, sociologists, um, religious leaders and religious scholars, right? Um, dispelling this myth that um, you have to have a certain background to be able to speak to, uh, for your work to be able to speak to how we resolve conflicts, both globally and domestically, specifically around race, right? And so the, the book is really a catch-all, an attempt to reinvert the paradigm and provide scholars of African descent with perspectives that are African-centered that um, promote remedies and recommendations for how we go about resolving racial issues, the racial issues of our time. Fascinating, really such important work. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your, the view of, your view of the importance of history in this process of racial reconciliation and uh, restorative justice by talking a bit about your book, your monograph, The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams and the Politics of Racism in the Free State. The book recovers events that took place in the early 1930s in the town of Salisbury, Maryland. Why is Maryland named a free state? And why is, it that, why is the state of Maryland important in the history of racial terror violence in the US? Sure. Um, Maryland is named the free state dating back to 1864, um, where um, you know slavery was abolished as a border state. It dates back to that period, however, there were also, um, there's lore associated with the usage of the term, the phrase, excuse me, you know, the free state, um, dating back to the prohibition era as well. Um, but I think for me, I mean, in understanding how we, we deal with and understand, you know, this nomenclature naming of states and nicknaming, what I see thematically in looking at the history of Maryland is this, you know, this autonomy or this, the ways in which Maryland is set apart in many ways 
and wanting to be recognized as being set apart. And, and that may be for good or bad. Um, I think um, that's something that's very consistent, even with the earlier usages of the term, the phrase, um, the nickname, the, excuse me, the later um, usages during the Prohibition era. It all spoke to Maryland being radical and independent and saying, we're going to do what is opposite and be, we're a place of freedom. I um, mean, we're not going to adhere to what um, is proposed at the federal level, right? Um, and, and a lot of what I'm, I was able to do within my book is talk about that juxtaposition, that unique character um, that Maryland possesses and the ways in which it has in many ways went under the radar in terms of traditional studies that are associated with racial terror lynching in Maryland, in the United States, excuse me. Um, and so that is one of the things that drew me to Maryland. As um, I mentioned in the book, um, there's a hyper emphasis that's placed on the Deep South when, when looking at racial terror lynchings. And um, I sought out in this book to um, look beyond the abstractions and to salvage the human story by looking specifically at one specific case um, of lynching in an area, again, that's not focused on um, in terms of geographical, in the geographical sense. And what I noticed is that in terms of the characteristics of this specific case, in connection to the other characteristics of other cases um, in the Deep South, there are so many similarities um, and there's also divergences as well and differences. However, I think it dispels this myth again that um, the terror that black people were suffering in the Deep South was somehow um, lesser than that was that was suffered um, in other areas in border states such as Maryland. And so um, for six years, I began researching the specific case of Matthew Williams um, documenting his story, but also the story of his community as well. Who was Matthew Williams and how did you learn about his story? I first learned about Matthew Williams um, in um, an amazing book and who's scholar by a scholar, Professor Sherilyn Eiffel, um, who I, I respect and appreciate and I'm thankful for her endorsement and support of my work. She wrote a book in 2007 that highlighted um, these specific two specific cases, um, the lynching of Matthew Williams and George Armwood. And I noticed in her analysis and in her research that like most cases and most um, studies of racial terror lynching, they're highly dependent upon newspaper accounts um, and um, both of, of both black of the black and white press, but for the most part the white press. And so um, I sought out to um, investigate and to learn more about the lived experiences and the actual cases of lynching that she documented, specifically on Maryland's lower eastern shore. Um, and most of the attention within the state of Maryland within regional studies focuses on the last documented lynching, which is the lynching of um, George Armwood that took place in 1933. But I wanted to get an understanding of this legacy of racial terror and this unrelenting onslaught of racial terror that we saw um, during, right at the turn, right at the beginning, excuse me, of the um, stock market crash of 1929 and make a correlation. So my argument in many ways was we, can, we can't start with George Armwood in 1933 without understanding the racial terror lynching and the racial terror that emerged throughout the U.S. but also within this region beginning in 29, which is what the book does, and Matthew Williams's case serves as that um, climactic case in that moment where you see what um, is going on in the Deep South um, being directly connected to what is going on in Maryland, specifically um, the overall national attack of black on black laborers that's happening during this era. Why did you call the book The Silent Shore? So one of the things that Professor Eiffel um, deals with, as most scholars deal with, not being able to, within her research, is not being able to get people to discuss this history. Um, what I noticed in my research was that, um, you know, there were so many people whose family members, relatives, fathers, parents who were alive, who some of them who witnessed this lynching and participated, um, and on both sides of both black and white communities. And, um, you know, what we recognized 
we were able to identify people in in records in newspaper accounts but when we went to talk to them about it um, there was a silence that is palpable to this day um, in this community in the community of Salisbury in both the black and white community um, and the silence sure as a title speaks to um, that silence but it also um, provides context as well and pushes back against that silence at the same time and hidden in full view is another re the title of the hidden in full view series is something that um, provides additional insight into what we're dealing with as we think about um, the national memory associated with um, these specific cases and how that is adopted and framed right and so but just because there was silence within the black communities um, about how they publicly spoke about it. Yes, there was silence there, but within their own families um, and within their own communities, it was known, well known and talked about, right? And a lot of the work that I'm doing is to help, is to rebuild the trust associated with those communities and with those um, individuals, both black and white, whose families may have participated in these lynchings and or whose families suffered as a result bringing those voices to the fore um, is something that we're working on. That's what the series is all about. You've done an amazing job of historical recovery, given that silence. Um, how did how did you manage that? How did, how did you pierce that silence? Well, so um, as I like to see myself as a history detective in some ways, um, always love detective shows, Carmen Sandiego, um, you know, as a kid, trying to push those on my son. Uh, he's not liking it too much. We'll see. He likes math. Um, I, I'm still fighting. But, um, you know, I really saw myself as many ways a salvaging expert in this work. And so I took Professor Eiffel's book as in many ways the Bible in many ways in regards to my research. And I began to, again, look at sources using traditional methods. And again, as I mentioned, there was a hyper emphasis on newspaper accounts. And so um, we were. I was thankful to be able to glean from the amazing reporting that was done within the Baltimore Afro-American. And within the Baltimore Afro-American, there are specific um, references to various government reports and other items in which are just brief references, you know, that are for, for someone who's not looking to in too much detail, you know, that, okay, there was, a, there was a report, I imagine it was destroyed. What I ended up doing is going through those newspaper accounts, identifying the records that were mentioned and searching and looking for those records, not um, just taking the um, taking the idea that you know, most of these things are destroyed. I felt that, you know, I needed to search out and do everything that I could to identify, to find records that could substantiate and corroborate the lived experiences, the trauma that these the black community has talked about and discussed and is a part of, um, you know, who they are. Right. And so I did that, went to the state archives and began searching for these records and um, I talk about a lot of this frustration as a researcher that I had as a part as a part of um, the struggles that I had finding these records and so the records I actually identified were um, hidden away for 90 years within the state archives and uh, traditionally as I mentioned um, there's a myth associated with how we you know in terms of not a myth but there's a common refrain as associated with the ways in which racial terror lynchings are understood within our history as these mysterious acts that happened at the hands of persons unknown. One of the signature goals, again, of the work as well was to dispel this myth. And in the only way to do that in many ways is to find evidence and tangible data that speaks to what exactly happened. And so these investigations were essential. Um, and there's no surprise or secret that they were hidden away for 90 years and literally, um, I discovered a box of materials dating back to the, the period, contemporaneous interview, interview transcripts from both black and white witnesses. I also discovered a um, secret journal of a Pinkerton detective agent who was hired by the governor who did not trust local investigators um, to do a proper investigation because as, he, as most people during the period knew that lynchings were um, state locally sanctioned acts of racial terror and oftentimes he could not trust for a thorough investigation to be done because the local officials were involved so he hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency and this journal that I discovered was so um, was groundbreaking in that 
it provides it's a day to day account of um, the mob um, uh, infiltration of the mob in which was behind the lynching and it lays out the structure of the mob um, all the way from the roles of institutions that were complicit and individuals who represented those institutions down to the exact details that provide evidence of culpability and guilt um, and it provides us insight as I mentioned into the psychology of racial to, of, of lynching mob, lynch mobs but also in the to the structural and class-based dynamics that are, are that manifest um, as well um, in addition to the racial dynamics one of the things I think for me that has been so important is you know looking at this book as a tool as a resource utilize again central to what how I think and as I frame history and I think about history how can history be used as a tool or as um, you know what's the utility in history as we think about and I think it's essential I mean we, we saw yesterday the um, judge who allowed the Tulsa case to go forward and and I can't imagine what would where we would be at if the history of John Hope Franklin and others um, was not centered and validated and promoted and supported I think that is where I see the next phase of my work going and why I'm so thankful for um, the Oregon Humanities Center and for the work that you all are doing because this is where we can show people right this is why history is this valuable this is why funding humanities is valuable because it has tangible ramifications on how transformation um, will, will manifest itself within communities how justice really will be um, gained by communities who have in many ways been suffering in silence for hundreds of years so a perfect example of this point that you've just made is that you are the vice chair of Maryland's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is the first commission of its kind in the United States. Tell us a little bit about the work of that commission and why it's so important. Sure. The, the commission was established amazingly in, in is a political volatile climate that we've been in, was a unanimous, unanimously decided on with the Maryland um, legislature um, and signed by a Republican governor. Um, that you know, that's something that we're extremely proud of, um, and it also speaks to this importance um, of pushing beyond the um, political divides to begin to have real conversations and work towards confronting the evils of our past. Um, and so we're thankful for you know the ways in which we were found, funded, and supported, and established. The commission's goal is to investigate the forty-three and growing um, numbers of lynchings that took place in Maryland between the 1850s and 1930s. Um, and as I mentioned, the number it continues to grow as we get additional information. Um, and so we're tasked to investigate these cases, each individual case, um, and provide remedies to the governor um, and the legislature at the end and the conclusion of our um, hearing. We're thankful to have received a $300,000 grant from the Department of Justice under the Emmett Till Cold Case Investigation Act to pay for the cost associated with um, establishing the commission and doing the historical research, the um, hiring genealogists and others that will help us identify descendants, but also working with legal scholars and others who can help us analyze um, specific historical materials um, and evidence and records such as the records I discovered in Salisbury to be able to make a case for justice and repair within the communities that are continuing to be impacted by this violence. How have the people of Maryland been responding to the work of the commission? So we, we try to stay away from the blogs, um, but in terms of those communities in which we've engaged, um, we, we are thankful again of um, the support that we have across the board um, from a number of um, people um, from various regions and coalitions. I can speak to specifically the region that I'm tasked with working with, and that is the Lower Eastern Shore community in Salisbury, Maryland. And I am extremely thankful for um, Salisbury and the mayor, um, Jake Day. Me and him just did an event for Princeton University's um, Bridging Divides initiative. and. The model that's set there is a model, I think, in Salisbury and in um, the Lower Eastern Shore is a model that I think can be duplicated across the state 
um, as we continue to uncover this history and engage with the communities who are grappling with the legacies of um, racial terror lynching. And um, they're early on in the process. Um, the Salisbury community, in many ways, was sort of an outlier in that you had a, a municipal government, city government, that decided to support and own this history and, and embrace this. This is a lot different from what we see in other places across the country where it's locally led. Yes, it should be, but oftentimes the um, it's not associated with any type of municipal support or backing. And I think um, that is something that um, I'm extremely uh, proud of um, regarding the work that we're doing in Salisbury, but also um, the frame and the ways in which um, the mayor is taking direction from those who have been on the ground doing this work before, again, when there was this silence amongst um, their community, right, um, regarding talking about their, their trauma, right? So that's something that's important, centering the descendant communities and the community voices. And that's something that's happening in Salisbury. And it's also happening in other areas of Maryland as well. Uh, on June 4th, we have the Baltimore County Lynching um, Commission hearing. The commission, not only do we investigate the hearings, but we also have truth and reconciliation style hearings, um, around three, out, three to five hour hearings that'll be held where we interview um, actual descendants of victims and perpetrators. And we also talk with and work with social workers and other trauma experts, um, legal scholars and others, historians, to be able to make, again, the case for repairing the damage that's been done to these communities as we work towards our producing the um, proposals and remedies that we have for the main, for the governor. So you mentioned earlier the film Hidden in Full View out of the archive racist plans are laid bare. And this is a this film is part of a projected series of films. Tell us a little bit about that series. Sure. And so for the first year, the series centers around the specific case of Matthew Williams in the Salisbury community. We're thankful um, to have gained the support of the Association of Research Libraries and a number, number of other organizations who have, will be joining the effort um, to establish an archive for culture and racial healing, which is a national archive proposed within the legislation to establish a U.S. Truth Commission by Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Um, the first archive of its kind based on that legislation will be um, established in Salisbury, Maryland within the Charles Chipman Cultural Center, which is the actual former church that Matthew Williams attended. And it is the only building that remains of the 19 black businesses, homes, and um, properties um, of the black Georgetown community in Salisbury, Maryland. And so we are indeed grateful for this historic opportunity to surround the, com the community of Georgetown, the Chipman Cultural Center, with the resources that it needs to be able to tell their story and sustain themselves in the future. Um, and so the film centers around not only um, the specific case, the series stems around, centers around the case of Matthew Williams, but it also um, focuses on, excuse me, the community as well. And so telling the community story, um, the community, the interviews that we will be conducting as well with the descendants. And so in March of this past year, we finished filming um, interviews with the descendants of victims and perpetrators. That will be included in the series and we'll work through those interviews where we look at black, um, the descendants of victims um, and then the descendants of perpetrators talking about white silence, but also the ways in which in the humanities and within spaces at large, we can wrestle with and begin to develop practices that um, are more equitable and are more anti-racist and speak to um, the needs of the communities. Um, one of the things that's important about the work I think is informed by my research is making sure that we are developing and working towards implementing practices um, that um, move beyond the extraction-based models that institutions have as we seek to engage with communities, right? Um, and so we're literally utilizing the work that we're doing in Salisbury um, with the establishment of this archive by processing all of the records that are held within the Chipman Cultural Center, 
as well as the records of that community. We'll be di building a digital website and map that documents the history of this community, the racial terror lynchings associated with the community, but it also documents the um, prominence and uh, of the community, documents historical figures of the community, veterans, uh, business owners, whose stories have, are, have been in many ways hidden in full view. Um, and so that's the overall theme and trajectory. But for the first year, we're focusing on the Salisbury community. For the next series, um, next year, we'll be focusing on another community in the US. We, I don't wanna give that away yet, but each year we will have a specific community nationally that we focus on. But Maryland um, and Salisbury is the focus for this first year. Well, thank you, Charles, for speaking with us today about your um, uh, really fascinating and important work. We're looking so forward to hearing from you again on the 17th. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. I've been speaking with Charles Chavis, Jr., Assistant Professor of Conflict Resolution and History and the Founding Director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice, and Race at the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. As the Oregon Humanities Center's 2021-2022 Tzedek Lecture, Chavis will screen the short film Hidden in Full View, Out of the Archive, Racist Plans Are Laid Bare on May 17th. The film will be followed by a discussion about his book, The Silent Shore, The Lynching of Matthew Williams, and the Politics of Racism in the Free State. Thank you so much for watching.